First, uh, does everyone have their ID? Yeah. yeah, you don't have to show me, I, I really don't care. But uh, the, um, if you do, and I hope so, um, most likely it's a driver's license. They're sort of ubiquitous, everybody has them these days, every day, I have for a long time. I've, had, I've been licensed in five different states myself, but the one that I remember most was the first one. And not just because it was first, but it was, um, well I learned how to drive in Texas. And, um, and that's sort of special because no matter where you are, they've got more miles of paved road between where you are and where you want to go. Just about <laughs> anyways. But uh, it was also special because if you think about it, when you need to know who you are before you get behind a wheel. Because there's too many people out there trying to prove who they are uh, once they're driving and we don't need that. And Texas gave, gives you a leg up on your identity. It was a special place, and I know that because our teachers told us it was. In, uh, in junior high school, I know there's been some mention of junior high schools here, um, and some of these folks have, are oriented towards middle schools, but junior high was seventh and eighth grade. And in junior high school, um, we had a course, an hour every day for the full school year, on Texas state history. And at the end of the year, we had a Texas history fair, and we all brought in projects that, that our, our, mostly our parents had made, but, but we carried them in. And, and when the movie John, uh, The Alamo came out, with the John Wayne version, we were all loaded on the buses and taken down to the local theater where we had a special matinee showing. And what we learned from that was that those heroes, and I'm not talking about the actors, I'm talking about the real men of uh, Davy Crockett and Jim Bowie, uh, William um, Travis and Sam Houston were all born someplace else. And the lesson was that people who choose to live in a place often contribute more than those who are there through an accident of birth. And Texas was very welcoming to strangers and, and people who were strange. And, <laughs> and, and, and Downright weird folks were, were not only tolerated, but sometimes celebrated. Uh, d d down the road from uh, our town was the Hogg Mansion. Now, Big Jim Hogg had been the governor of Texas. That's Hogg with two G's. And um, he was the 20th governor and the first one to be born in the state. But he's remembered most today because he named his daughter Ima. No. Now, I'm a hog grew up to be one of the great ladies of the state, did many good works, but I've never met anyone who thought that name was a good idea. As a matter of fact, there's even a, a myth that's widely believed that uh, she had a daughter, a sister named Europe. But the point of, of, of bringing that up is that. Um, in spite of this appalling thing he did to his daughter, Big Jim had a very successful political career. And we were taught that uh, a person, the quality of a person's work should not be judged by their personal life. We were learning many things there. Uh, by the same token, there were few, if any, zoning laws. <laughs> now, my family lived in a, one of the post-war housing developments with street after street of cookie cutter homes on uniformly small lots with a china berry tree in the front yard. And when I joined the 4-H club, my project was rabbit breeding. We built hutches in the backyard. At the height of my career, I had some 30 bunnies back there. These were New Zealand whites, the big ones with the pink eyes. And from time to time, we raised the occasional chicken, and not as a pet. And one time we even brought a lamb home from my grandfather's farm when the mother refused to nurse it and we raised that. And the neighbors never said anything to us about all our livestock because it was on our property. And what you do on your own property is nobody else's business. <laughs> this was a very liberating and empowering place to grow up. You knew who you were, you see. Um, but the best thing about being in my generation at that place was that the Texas State Legislature, in its infinite collective wisdom, 
had determined that 14 was the minimum age for an unrestricted driver's license. Now, they did this because there were so many farms and ranches there, and the kids on those places would often drive tractors and farm machinery, sometimes on the public roads, and they thought it was better to have them legal. Uh, the law did not benefit the kids who lived in cities. Places like Houston still required their, uh, everyone to be 16. And it really didn't benefit the farm kids either, because when they weren't going to school, they were driving tractors and farm machinery. <laughs> but for those kids in small towns, especially those whose parents could afford more than one vehicle, they were the ones who benefited. That was my group. <laughs> the trick was you had to take driver's education. And the schools did that during the summer session. So uh, it was taught by a trio of coaches, or football coaches. They seemed to get all, the, all the, these extra jobs. And the course was uh, consisted of three parts. In the first part, was in the classroom, of course, where, you, where we learned the rules of the road and which hand you hold your beverage in. <laughs> um, actually, I'm just joking about that. Beverage holding was one of those things you had to learn at home, along with, <laughs> along with manual shift and, and how to get busy with your companion in the front seat and not leaving the horn. Um, yeah, I, I don't know if, about the rest of you, but I, I miss those bench seats, you know? When you could go out on a drive and you put your arm around your best girl and you have your beverage in your hand. I mean, driving was an adventure. Uh, there, there, there are people who, who uh, have wondered over the past couple decades why church attendance has fallen off, and I, I blame it on bucket seats and cup holders. <laughs> we just don't need God like we used to. But after the, the, the classroom, we, we went outside of the second part where we walked around the car and learned all the parts of the automobile and had to perform two tasks. The first was we had to locate the dipstick and, check the, and learn how to check the oil. The second was that everyone had to change a tire. Now, a lot of the girls raised objections here because you remember, in those days, the girls still wore dresses to school with petticoats, you know, and they had the big hair. And the ones who complained said they were going to break a nail, or they were going to get dirty, or they didn't have the strength to, to do that, and they never intended to be any place where there wouldn't be a male around them. <laughs> but I noticed that none of them complained afterwards. And I have, I, I, I believe that that became one of the foundation stones of the feminist movement in the Southwest. <laughs> because Tens of thousands of 14-year-old girls learned that they could jack up a 2,000-pound car, break loose a frozen lug nut, and change a tire by themselves. And if they could do that, what else could they do? So I've always thought that's well. And that was a wonderful part of it. The best part, of course, was the third part where we actually got to drive. There was four of us in a car. Uh, in my car, there were three boys and a girl. And of course, you had the coach who was the instructor sitting on the passenger seat. We got to drive, uh, rotate, and we drove about 15 minutes for each one of us. And by the time my turn came around, we were outside of town on a farm road. So um, we parked, I got out of the car, and I walked around. It was a beautiful summer day, not a cloud in the sky anywhere. And on either side of the road, as far as you could see, were, were the shimmering leaves of rice. Down on the Gulf Coast, there are a lot of rice farms or at least there were. And um, ahead of me, there was, the, the road was as straight as a beam of light and almost as bright because in the rest of the world, when they don't pave a road, they cover it with gravel. But down on the Gulf Coast, they covered it with seashells that were bleached white. I don't know where they got them. I think from some dredging operation or other, but we had miles and miles of shell roads. So I got in the car and I, I adjusted the seat, I checked the mirrors, I didn't bother with the seat belt because we didn't have any in those days. <laughs> I looked back and forth both ways and I put my foot on the brake and started the engine and released the handbrake and shifted into drive and put on the blinker and looked both ways again. There was nobody on the road and I eased out. We weren't allowed to go more than 25 miles an hour, which was probably a good idea. And I took my time getting there. I got up to 25. I looked in the rearview mirror and there was another car behind me. 
Now, he was well back, but I figured he didn't have the same speed restrictions I did, so he was going to be catching up to me pretty soon. And I looked to make sure I had enough room. Uh, there were no stripes on the road because you can't paint white stripes on a white road. And um, I was going along. I was actually concerned more about the drainage ditch on the side than I was about the car. There wasn't any shoulder, really, to the road. Back. And I looked in the mirror again, and this guy was really gaining on me. He was speeding. And I'm thinking, well, okay. Uh, and just then the coach says, get over to the right. So I moved over a little bit to the right. And this, check out the, where I am in the ditch and where everything else is. And I look in the mirror again, and this guy's practically on my bumper now. He is really moving. And the coach says, get over to the right. Okay. There's not much right to get over to, but I'll move over a little more. And then I'm, the, the right wheels of the car are on the edge of the shells and on the edge of the dirt. And going thumping it, thumping it, thumping it, right like that. And this guy goes by me, disappears in a cloud of white dust. And I look in the mirror, and there's nobody behind him. Okay, I can get back where I'm supposed to go. And the coach says, get over to the right. And before I can say what, he grabs the wheel and pulls it over, and we go right off the road and into the drainage ditch. And I'm sitting there like this. Um, and I, well, well, then, yeah. And then I hear, and I look up the window and see the undercarriage of an airplane. And then I see the back end of a yellow biplane go across the road at an altitude of about four feet. Now the kids in the back seat had been down on the floor because they had seen this crop duster crossing back and forth across the fields. And he had to go stay low to go underneath the telephone wires. And uh, the other car had been racing to avoid just the same situation we were in. Well, um, when I got my driver's license, I had some extra, I had learned two extra things that most people don't get in their courses. The first was that whether you're driving or doing anything else, it is a mistake to keep your eyes on the road all the time. If you don't know what's going on all around you, you might get hit by a crop duster. <laughs> the second lesson was with the, uh, the example that the coach set. Now, he could have given me more information, but he did, never raised his voice. He never got excited. He saved all our lives with a minimum of fuss and never said a word about it afterwards. And now, half a century on, I realize uh, that's what I've been trying to be. So, uh, there you are. <laughs>